So yeah, I've been trying. I've been trying to get hold of cops on his multiple numbers. They all go straight to voicemail. Phone switched off. And you send him emails. He doesn't open his email. He has like twenty thousand unread emails in his inbox. He never opens opens his inbox. So that's he was he was living with. he was living digital minimalism before fucking <laughs> Cal Newport even put pen to paper. Ah, cha cha. Anyway, in the world of venture, which there's been many things going on, and we've been we've been on this as we said in previous episodes, this planned hiatus. Or not hiatus, I'd say decreased cadence temporarily because of all the all the good stuff or busy stuff we're dealing with in professional and personal lives. But again, here we go. We finally managed to squeeze in an episode. And <laughs> welcome back to Irrational VC. We haven't done an episode in a few months. And uh, fucking hell, what's happened to the entire market? Gone to shit. Everything's gone to shit. Uncle Samir Kaji had a goat tweet. Previous guest, by the way, check out his episode linked below. But he had a great tweet where talking about, you know, all the tourists leaving, uh, leaving the asset class and the people who are really here for the long term are here to remain. I actually think it's a great time for anyone. I've mentioned this as well. Anyone with access to capital who's here for the long term, you know, teams are more efficient. You get the cliche of Uber and Airbnb were built in downturns. So I think it's a great time, especially for us as investors as syndicate leads so yeah exciting times it is and we're going to talk about something today which is on the back of a tweet thread from mr ryan hoover himself you can give an intro on who he is but basically a thread on why we're doing syndicates and what the other options for investors are so do you want to get started for sure so uh quick background you've probably been living under a rock Ryan Hoover, founder of Product Hunt. He later sold that to AngelList a few years ago. I can't remember the exact figure. It may have been 20 million sale or something, maybe more. He sold it to Naval and Bobach Nivi. He sold it to the, the crew at AngelList. Ryan then started Weekend Fund. Weekend.fund is the domain. Elite portfolio, very, very impressive portfolio, which I think really is due to the access that he has had due to the early days of Product Hunt. I think this is... One of the few people where you can say the creme de la creme of deal flow, basically. And he's very experienced. So since setting up Weekend Fund, uh, has done really well. Now, he had a thread a few months ago that has just been in the back of my mind since he published this tweet, Twitter thread, because it relates to us a lot. If you remember late Q, sort of Q4, Q1, me and you were going back and forth because I guess some people make these decisions really quickly, but... Oh, the rational, the rational lens, because I think these decisions literally affect the trajectory of your career and long term. It's very important to take a little while to analyze both sides. And so we were contemplating starting a VC fund a few months ago where everyone and their auntie was raising money. And we actually had people approach us. We had soft commits, soft commitments for those who don't know, to start a VC fund a few million out the gates. We did all the all the back and forth of pros and cons between us, you know, using the rational side, the gut instinct, the whatever, whatever, whatever. In the end, we decided not to for a lot of the reasons which we'll go into. Some of the reasons actually Ryan mentioned on this Twitter thread, which I'm talking about. And this Twitter thread, he compares the pros and cons of angel investing versus being a scout for other sort of big VC funds versus joining a fund versus running SPVs or syndicates in other terms, or just starting a fund. So he compares these five options and the pros and cons of each. Let's kick this off. What do you wanna, how do you wanna kick this off? There's a point around who the target audience is and at what point you wanna start these things and, and, and the timeline to, to doing these things that's important to note and caveat before we start. My view is, Everyone is in a different situation, right? So this is not investment advice. So don't take this for gospel. But the point we're trying to say is just like, there are multiple options for different types of people. For us, syndicates seems to be the place where it makes the most sense for us to start. For a lot of people, that isn't. And we'll get into the reasons behind that. I want to start with angel investing, because I think that's the one that people most want to do and i think people most understand whether or not you have a background in venture or not ryan gives a nice pros and cons list of why angel investing is interesting but at the base level let me just explain what it is when we talk about angel investing all we're saying is that you are one an accredited investor so someone who has the capital means by any law in any given country to invest in these startups and two it's angel investing in the sense of you're supporting businesses really get off the ground you're not supporting later stage more developed businesses right so with those two or those three caveats his view is that 
angel investing, he doesn't give a view, but he gives a pros and cons list. His, his, his pros and con list basically says that for an angel investor, if you're putting in tiny checks, you get deal by deal carry. So you get a return on every investment you make. It's not a broad single return profile, which is important in, when we get onto some of the other points around a fund. You don't need to fundraise because you're using your own capital and you, there's, no, there's no reliance on any LPs or limited partners. You build your own brand name, which is super important. And we can talk about that in a second. And you don't have to give a lot of justification or structure as to why you're entering specific deals. He, list, he literally says YOLO into deals without justification. Again, not investment advice. Do not fucking YOLO into random deals just because random people are getting into it and, and people who you admire are getting into it. That's not what we're saying. But what we are saying is that he's got a point around there's minimal structure. You can do what you want basically with your own money. Yeah, to be honest, look, it doesn't mean the other options we're going to discuss today actually does not mean in most cases that just because you angel invest, you can't do the other things. So for instance, we micro angel invest, which is pretty much what he's kind of referring to as well, which is throwing tiny checks. And obviously the classic article I wrote around how to become a micro angel investor. And I refer to Shervin Pishavar and a few of the goats who kicked off their career in Silicon Valley by just throwing 5k checks for example or actually in the uk let's talk about our friend alex mcdonald he had a tweet recently which said his one of his first or early angel investments returned 26x he just used the returns from that and recycle it to make a bunch of new angel investments from the returns on one and that's similar to some of the other people who how they started of course with anything and everything here there's some luck involved but actually early stage is a lot of luck involved but it doesn't mean you don't have the talent or the work rate to build the network and the deal flow required because that's key here if you are doing these checks as i mentioned in this micro angel investing essay or if people like shervin or alex or several others i mean as sriram krishnan said you shouldn't look at it as a way of making money you should look at it as a way of creating optionality for your career later down the line just because of the rooms you'll be in the networks you'll build the friends you'll make i think it's it's exceptional what it can do for your career in tech and everyone should be doing just a little bit like put in similar to crypto we've mentioned this a million times it's speculative so put in what you're willing to lose if you want to just throw in let's say even 1k check at a startup once a quarter so that's 4k per year totally fine like it's just about being involved to some degree but the cons with this are one there is no leverage on the capital so if if your 1k check does a 10x which is is not often that you can 10x a company it's a madness it's a madness, it's a madness. It's you know this the statistics as they say the statistics is a mad thing as they say so if that 1k is going to 10x to 10k which firstly is very very difficult or rare to happen then you only make 9k and then obviously take off the tax and all that shit basically you're not really doing much as i said you're mainly doing it for the optionality that it creates for your career so there's no leverage on capital whereas if you put in a 100k check and that 10x is well you've made almost a million in profit so there's no leverage on the capital as the great eric jorgensen our previous guest the king of leverage discusses and secondly, linking in back to that point, another downside of angel investing is that money is required, ideally enough to build a portfolio and diversify. So for most people, that's difficult. Some people hit it out the gate early on, like Shervin, Alex and others, and they recycle that cash. But for most people, you're not going to hit a 26x out of the gate or early on in your career. To wrap up on angel investing, do it. Do tiny bits of money you're just willing to lose, similar to crypto. Similar, It's basically speculation or gambling at that point. But don't look at it as something to return because even if it 10x is, you're not really returning much. Do it as something to create optionality in your career. And I think anyone in tech should be, especially once they're a few years into their career, they've taken care of the basic finances and needs of life. They should be throwing some tiny checks here and there and mingling with the right people because it can do wonders for your career long term. We've done a whole episode on barbell investing and the approach to risk adjusted returns, if you want to call it that, but basically low risk investing do all the main things you need to do, invest in the S&P and whatever it is and invest in index funds and you know have a mortgage or whatever, whatever it is that essentially keeps your money relatively safe. But on the flip side, everything we're talking about now is maybe 5%, 10% of your entire capital that you should be talking about. So when, when he says you need money, ideally enough to build a portfolio and diversify, for a lot of these people, that money is coming out the 10% pot right so it's it's very very small it's it's a very small proportion of their overall investment so if you're someone who has like 2k spare at the end of every month it may not make sense for you to just go and angel invest it may there may be other options which which you're going to come on to in a second exactly so second option scouting let's get into it 
And I think a great example you can give is the wonderful, the GOATS, Mr. Jason Calacanis, who was a scout for Sequoia, and he scouted the Uber deal. So let's get into the scouting option, pros and cons. What have you got? Calican is a brilliant example. There's loads of current scouts as well, by the way. It's not like a dead industry where Calicanus did it 15 years ago. It still happens a lot. And, and actually, as networks become more distributed, so as more random people end up having amazing networks in the, in the startup community, and as a result of more startups coming about, so both in terms of distribution and number, i.e. E. your N, as that grows, you're basically going to get a lot more optionality as an individual to go and pitch to a startup and say, I, I, can, I can be a scout for you because I've got loads of deal flow for you. So anyway, the pros of scouting, the best bit is that whole money thing we just spoke about. You don't really need your own capital, right? You get a proportion of the investment as a kickback or you get some sort of payment or you get some level of carry by bringing this deal to the venture capital fund. They see value in this in the long term. And so they'll probably reward you for it. The second thing is, as I said, it's relatively accessible. If you're building a network, if you work in startup land, you already probably have a few connections that people in venture don't have as a result of just being an operator. And it's very flexible. So essentially you can just reach out to any venture capitalist on Twitter because fucking hell, they all live on Twitter and they have no lives apart from Twitter. So just reach out to, to fucking random mandem on, on Twitter and, and you'll be able to provide them some value if if you do have the right network and the right opportunity for them. So I should slide into someone's DM and just say, yes, bruv, got me a deal. <laughs> so again, as you, as you, I guess earlier when we opened this in the introduction, you said, look, it's not to say any of these options are the best. It completely depends on your personal circumstances and preferences. So for someone like me and you, I'll tell you why Rational has decided to never go down the scouting route. We did think about it in the early days and didn't take long to say no. Just personal preference, even if we could make a lot more from scouting, I don't think necessarily is the case, but even if we could, for us, this is extremely fun and it's fun to build. I think it's a lot more fun to build your own brand and to do your own thing and the classic skin in the game and skin in the game in every sense, not just sort of, let's say, reputational funds, but also skin in the game of everything you do is under, e even when I put out these crazy tweets or LinkedIn posts where they're like, oh, oh he, you're not supposed to say those things. That's skin in the game because, you know, it's, it's, it's under the personal name. We can do that. Whereas if you're scouting for someone and you build up a good relationship and they see these fucking crazy posts or stuff that I put out, which is uh, it's freedom, then they may not like it. They'd be like, oh, this guy's a bit out of control. We don't want to be associated with him. And the second thing is to scout for the very big, impressive funds, like let's say a Sequoia. Well, the reason Mr. Jason Calacanis could scout for them is because he is Jason Calacanis. He had been in the game for 10, 20 years and his life was building deal flow. It was his full-time job to do content and get deal flow off the back of it. For most of you, if you are working in, let's say, a tech career or job or whatever, any human being can only focus on two to three things at once in life at most. We had this discussion the other day, which is, okay, so day job, let's say we're both operators working in the day job. That's the first thing. At night, we do the whole rational brand content and fund and whatever. And then the third thing, we like to lift weights, go in the gym, whatever. Genuine is the truth. Like a human being can only do three things. I don't know why the fuck you're laughing. You're making... <laughs> laughing because i hear i hear this i hear this pitch i mean cyrus when cyrus talks cyrus is pitching remember this yeah and then, so i'm he, always pitching he, uh, he's ABC. always pitching no seriously though i don't know what, what fucking pitch there is in this it's more just uh i guess anyway make me lose track of my fucking thought golden thoughts it's true though like a human being can only focus on three things at most at once in their life like you can't there's this expectation you're supposed to be doing a million things you fucking can't be doing a million things so if we're doing day jobs which is being operators like a career in tech secondly we're doing rational which is content and checks and the third thing is we're lifting weights and then the gym and just looking after your health we haven't even got to shit like social life uh, a, a partner a life partner like family like other shit hobby like fuck hobbies the rational is my hobby but we haven't even got to the other stuff so if on top of that, you're then running around trying to scout deals, you're going to find, find it to be very difficult because maybe your hobby isn't to do content and get deal flow off the back of it. There have been a lot of scouting initiatives popping up in Europe last couple of years, if I'm not mistaken. Is it Axel? They've created a scouting initiative in Europe and a few other tier one firms. Sequoia as well. I think they're the OGs of it. But if, if you want to and if you can, for sure, go for it. But you're dependent on a single capital provider and their brand. So... You don't have full control. You don't have full, I guess, it's not fun. It's not, so you might, I don't give a shit if we make a lot less than scouting, which I don't think we will, but we'll make more. But I think long-term, even if we make less, I, I'd much take this route. It's just so much more fun. 
and you have full control and it's all about autonomy and freedom and i don't know if that's from the ptsd passed down from the previous iranian generation to us and the revolution but there's always this big point of freedom around everything i say and do which is just pure fun pure autonomy pure freedom but at the same time pure skin in the game like you are responsible for those actions there's one important point on all of this is that at the end of the day none of these things are mutually exclusive yeah so you can do you can do all of them together it's just prioritize i think your point is in life you generally need to prioritize imagine on, on top of all the things you said imagine having kids like jesus christ especially young kids and a lot of venture capitalists are young parents by nature of their age and the the, the, the industry's requirement to be a little bit more a little bit younger and, and about the times so anyway my point is you don't have to do all of this stuff separately just prioritize which one you're going to go for and then you can do all of them calicanis did all of these things that we're about to talk about again that's where the caveat of it was his full-time job but uh yeah you can do any and all of these you could throw 1k checks a quarter as we said angel invest your own little bit of money to create optionality in your career every now and then you could scout for a fund you could do all of these but it all depends on your personal circumstances so next option let's get into it joining a fund okay so let me talk about personal experience here because i have looked at joining funds slavery slavery exactly so so your view <laughs> is pretty clear already at least on the cons slavery does not decrease with wealth nasim taleb Sorry, carry on. I dare anybody to have a 10 minute conversation with Cyrus. And if, if Nassim Taleb doesn't come up in that conversation, I'll pay you a million pounds. You, you don't even need to go scouting or, or joining a fund. <laughs> Fuck, you know. Anyway, point is, shout out Nassim Taleb. <laughs> point is, joining a fund, what does that mean? It means joining a venture fund. It could mean joining any type of fund, really, an early stage private equity fund, for example. But why is it, why is it good? Is because if you join the right fund, this is a massive if, because over the last five years, so many quote unquote shit funds have basically just popped up because money's cheap and people can fucking invest in this space and it's cool and it's fun to do so loads of people want to do it if you join the right fund a tier one fund for example axel sequoia andreessen horowitz i don't know tiger even at this point or softbank or whatever you will have the opportunity to learn from experienced investors you will have the opportunity to work around people that know what they're doing and that are relatively rational about their approach because they're involved in this larger structure or organization that is a venture fund, which is an ironic statement in and of itself, but you'll learn from these people. So that gives you the initial platform to lead off of. And then there's the sort of secondary point which comes off the back of this which is you get compounding advantages of working with a team. What does that mean? It means that like by being in a team there are things that you can do a lot faster and that the value that as a team you could bring to an LP, an investor, or to a company, the companies that you're investing in, is far higher because there's more people to use. There is the ability to, you know, source more deals as a result. And then you also get a, like the brand value that goes with that business as well. So, so you're able to pitch companies and companies are more likely to want to work with you. So you take all of the positive elements of working for a large organization whilst also learning how a fund runs and you can you can do this all pretty quickly in the space of one or two years finally just the final positive point is that you don't have to worry about raising money right everything from that perspective is on the partner's shoulders so if you're a, a new joiner for example someone who's an associate level or something like that it might make sense for you for the first couple of years of your career to, to join a fund and really understand how things work so when someone says Oh, but Jimmy got a job at 816Z. I want to be like Jimmy. I'm going to go Harvard Business School MBA and I'm going to work two years here. Motherfucker fooled by randomness. You're, you're referring to the 0.01% who make it. And there's a lot of luck involved in that. Variables out of your control. You might turn up to the A16Z or the Sequoia interview final round. And maybe Mark Andreessen has just had a bad meeting with someone. Maybe someone pissed him off and he's just not in the mood or just it's it's all like we're all human so that is the least skin in the game it's handing your destiny to someone else i don't give a shit if it returns the most actually it won't it probably statistically is likely to return the least i think um, and even if you do make it which is very unlikely even we know some people with incredible cvs who don't even make it to these tier one firms and to be honest if you're not at a tier one then you shouldn't bother joining a fund in my view anyway just you could create your own and join the other millions of tier twos but at least you have autonomy and i think and this is my personal view again it's back to preferences but i'd rather have 30k a year with full autonomy than be someone's slave for three million a year when it comes to like venture investing and and all of that stuff so one it's slavery does not decrease with wealth and taleb shots at jamie diamond that refers to here as well and secondly as uh, hoover says monday partner meetings and internal selling 
Do I need to remind you of corporate shit show bureaucracy politics? <laughs> Smiley and chummy. Let's go to beers after work and network and build my brand and the company. Basically, I, I don't think we need to spend more time on this point. This was the least useful of the six options to spend time on. Basically, just fuck this option. Conclusion. It's, it's also one more thing on this around the cons point that you're mentioning is that the brand element is pretty clear in every single one of these options. What I mean by that is if you are doing any of this stuff, you are able to personally develop a brand on the back of the work you do. With this option around joining a fund, your brand gets diluted because you're part of a team and therefore the team gets recognition. Now that's not necessarily a bad thing, but as you grow over time, you want to get recognition for a lot of the deal flow that you're producing. I'll give you one last important point before we leave this option which is obviously we have friends, successful founders, raised eight figures plus in, in the venture space. Some of these people are in the UK tech scene, for example. They tell us what they think of some of these VC firms in London and the UK. For example, recently, one of them, they, they bitched to us about all of them. I mean, you can bleep this out if you want, but I'd say leave it in. He was like, they are shit. Like, these are not my views. This is this founder who had dealt with them. And it's not just to pick on them. There's several other firms mentioned by other founders as well. But I'm trying to just paint the picture of this is what founders think of most of these funds. So if you're joining a fund, that's what a founder thinks of you. These funds where the criteria to get in is you've been working in banking or consulting and you've not been an operator and you just have no idea, never had skin in the game. Your idea of growing up or fun is going to fun fucking Henley Regatta or some bullshit like that. It's, it's an extension of the cl classic banking private equity route. Now it's become common for that crowd to go into like VC. One of the reasons which we'll get onto why we made the decision to do syndicates for now, but one of the reasons we turned away from even doing our own fund, let alone join a fund, is that I said to Iman and he, he, we said the same thing to each other, like as if we were founders, we would not want to take checks from us if we were just to stay as like these corporate background guys forever. Like you need skin in the game. If you're not starting your own company, totally fine. You can be an operator at another tech company. Like you can rise the ranks from being, I don't know, whatever. We, we see day and night. We have so many friends. They start out in like a fucking little ops function next day next thing you know in one year they're like international expansion next year they're in they're like working on product next year they're head of ops back to ops and then before you know it the guy's like general manager of uk and europe and vcs are killing themselves to hire him because they know that's real value add you can actually add value for a founder rather than being another blood-sucking vampire on the board that has nothing to add other than fucking excel and powerpoint ability from corporate world so that's that like gain skin in the game in your career as well let's talk about starting a fund next the reason i want to talk about this one is because this is the least relatable so in the majority of cases with the people that we're talking to right now and talking about ourselves this is the biggest hurdle i think to cut to to jump over and often it requires you to already have a network but let, let me explain what we mean by this so starting a fund is basically going out creating one fund through a certain set of a certain set of time frames so call it fund one so if for us it'd be for example rational fund one and in that fund you collect as much money as possible up to a specific target even above that target if you wanted in order for you to then go away after the funding round is closed and start investing in a series of startups over time. So what that means is you need to put a hell of a lot of work in for a short period of time to get loads of LPs to commit, loads of limited partners, investors, to commit to putting money into your fund. Why is that good? Well, one is because you're creating immediate leverage. So you're able to use other people's money to make decisions for yourself. And therefore, the value that's created off the back of that is you taking carry on a larger number. You're taking a percentage of the profits at the end of the day on a larger number, which means more money for you if things go well. The second thing is that your LPs, so the people that then invest in you, can basically be supporting that flywheel of giving you deal flow, helping with the right people around due diligence, um, supporting your portfolio companies and how they how they operate. So they will have a network in and of themselves that can support you. So you're already immediately growing your really close network within the space. And then also the third thing is you don't actually have to cover a lot of your operating costs. OPEX is covered through management fees. So you can pay your employees, you can pay your bills, you can pay, I don't know, your expenditure for your offices and whatever it is, right? So everything kind of gets covered and you treat it more as a business. It's really, really established. But I, wanna, I want you to now describe what the cons are 
and why we decided not to start a fund and therefore go to the SPV one. Where do I start? There's probably a million reasons. Let's start with the points that Ryan says and I'll, I'll get into our specific reasons. So Ryan said's cons are fundraising mostly sucks. Yes, sir. LPs get paid back first. Yeah, well, I don't see an issue with that. That's how it should be. GP commits often required. You do need skin in the game, I think, but we've seen change in that where, to be honest, even Mac Conwell, he's raised without putting any, I don't think he put much of his own or any of his own money in, and he's not the only one, several big VCs or distinguished VCs. And lastly, you now have many bosses. Again, you have bosses in every area of life. You're always having to answer to someone. So I, I disagree with that. And Ryan says, he goes on to say, starting a fund was the right choice for me provides the right balance of autonomy and leverage, blah, 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 blah. For him, yes. So I'll explain for us. This is what I thought. So Ryan is Ryan. Ryan, as I said, as I started this, he has the creme de la creme deal flow in Silicon Valley. I don't think it gets any better. Like he's part of a group of like, I'd say maybe 20 or 30 people that have the best deal flow. I'd put him up there with like the Navals and the Ron Conways and the Imads and sev like several, but maybe 30, 40 people have this elite deal flow. So Again, fooled by randomness, if you're an outsider, don't follow what he's saying. You have to assess your own requirements as we started this episode, we've said 10 times in this episode. For us, we said, okay, we're not Ryan Hoover. We don't have that credibility or reputation. If we were to raise a fund now, which we could have done a few months ago, as I said, we had soft commitments and there'll be a market downturn, which we knew was coming, linked here in the show notes, episode recorded uh, just over a year ago in April, 2021, we said market bubble will pop and we outlined all the reasons and the analysis and it was bound to happen and it happened. And everyone said, oh, why are you being so pessimistic? <laughs> Not gonna make it. So we knew this shit was coming and we said, we don't know how long it's gonna go into a downturn for. And when it does go into a downturn, when the market was booming and people were raising funds and not doing well, their reputation was going to shit and you're not really able to raise a second or third fund, usually, let alone in a fucking market downturn. And now we've seen what, ha what has happened as Samir Kaji's tweet, which we'll pull up again. He said, we're going to see many LinkedIn updates to non-VC roles because all the tourists are leaving, all the people who got wrecked. And if we'd raised first fund just a few months ago, we would have probably struggled to raise a second fund. And even if you do raise the second, you struggle to raise the third and onward, definitely, especially because the, the payback period for these funds is 10 plus years and no one has visibility. So they're not going to trust your judgment yet. The second reason we didn't start a fund is because going back to the point I said earlier, I don't think we have enough operating experience. Why would a founder want to take a check from us? Now, if we're continuing to have the rational brand and pumping out content building network, then that's definitely some f form of value add, as we've seen with some of the people do this on the largest scale like Harry Stebbings you know his his network is just insane off the back of his podcast our network has been growing we have great content creation abilities in my view definitely not biased and all of these things that we do are value add but I said on top of that as as a rational continues to compound which is our network compound and our content creation ability compound and our visibility and reach compound imagine all of these things compounding but at the same time we are both in day jobs being operators in tech. So whatever it may be, but within five years, within a few years, you know, you may be a CPO, I may be a CTO, whatever, some company like large series B, series C, series A, whatever, or we've scaled a startup from pre-C to series B or C. This is incredibly valuable. There's many, many successful operator investors that we've seen. One example is Lenny Rachitsky, for example. He was previously Airbnb. This is going back to the classics. Uh, is it Scott Adams, the, you know, be good at three things or four things at once, and then you're suddenly this unique, or as Naval says, he refers to specialization is for insects and get good at a few things at once. You, you then create your own niche. You're one of one. So then, okay, then fucking out in a few years, you know, you, you take a bit from everyone. You take the, a leaf from, let's say, the Harry Stebbings of the world, which is you have a strong network and content creation distribution channel and uh, just good ability and reach to create content uh, that's engaging. That's the first leaf. The second leaf is you're a distinguished operator like Lenny Rachitsky. You've spent years in the trenches building tech companies as an operator. Great, wow, you've got experience of skin in the game. And I forgot what the third thing was, but basically you combine all these three things together, which fucking founder would be stupid enough to not take checks? Really strong founders now are taking our checks, let alone when all of this combines and compounds, which for the millionth time, I don't think any human being, even those who claim they do, really understand the true power of compounding. Gel all this together, compound it, flywheel, 
And I was like, in 10 years, we reassess. If you really like, if we really want to start a fund, then is the time. Because then we would also have, not only would we have all this value add and skin in the game through experience, but we would also have proof of concept from having done syndicates, which is a lot less pressure than doing a fund. If a fund goes to shit, your reputation goes to shit. Syndicates, you do deal by deal. It's more suited to our taste and preference and it aligns a lot more with our values. And I'll get on, and we'll get on to shortly, I want to hear your views, but why I think syndicates are much better than funds. Obviously, everything has its cons, but overall, I think syndicates are much better than funds. Basically, with syndicates, you are not charging management fees and you're putting in some of your own funds. If that not skin in the game, then fucking hell, I don't know what is. Compared to starting your own fund, charging a shit ton of management fees, that's that's being a charlatan in my view. That's being a grifter. You're charging management fees and then you're probably not returning anything and you're not putting any of your own money in. Doesn't align with our values. I think it's unethical. What do you make of all this? Yeah, I think with regards to what you said about values, values is key, right? So let's go back to what we started this whole discussion around, which was... Look, and any of these things will be, any of these options will be viable for different people. For us, our values are all about skin in the game, long-termism, uh, creating value, not being charlatans, all of this, all of this stuff, and not being necessarily opportunistic around a short time frame. And what I mean by that is, great if there's an opportunity to create a fund yeah that might be the right thing to do for some people that are more opportunistic and want to make a quick buck we don't want to do that but the thing about a fund which is really interesting is that with a fund you get very quickly you jump in with two feet in the water so often as a fund as someone who does a fund a lot of your time will have to go into managing the fund and creating essentially a business from scratch that you need to spend the majority of your time on. In that way, you get a lot of one credentials in the industry. So you learn probably much faster, but two, you get a lot more clout in the industry as a result of people seeing you now as a fund manager. You're not dipping your toe in this space. You are now 100% committed to doing this. And when people see that, well, this is what it should be. Now, I'll get on to why it might not be the case at the minute. When people see that, it gives you value uh, in, a, in an industry which is fundamentally very surface layer and is all about what people think of you. Often, is what is, it's about what people think of you as opposed to you know the value that you're actually creating, which is why we hear in a lot of back channels from founders and investors a lot of gossip around who's good and who's bad and who's just doing it for show. Put that all aside, for us personally, We are employing the barbell strategy in everything we do, not just our investing. And as such, we are hedging risk, particularly at this early part of our career, where we want to learn as much as we are providing support. And the best way for us to do that is not necessarily going and taking 50 million pounds from different LPs, 50 million USD, and, you know, immediately putting that into startups, not least because the market is completely fucked now and that would have been an issue for us in terms of raising fund two, three, et cetera. But the fundamental point here is that everyone will have a different preference when it comes to these things. And for us, fund just wasn't right. And I think we've been vindicated and our opinions have been vindicated as a result of that. What I suspect will happen in the next cycle is we'll go through this debt crunch cycle and we'll get to a point in maybe 10 years time where the new wave comes in. And at that point, you'll start seeing the same things occur again. And at that point, people need to make the make the distinction between, okay, do I do a fund for an opportunistic reason? Do I do a fund because I really want to spend the next 50 years creating funds? Or do I take an intermediary step and do something different? You know, create an SPV, which is what we're doing. And I think we should we should probably talk to that one now. What is an SPV? An SPV is a special purpose vehicle, which is a syndicate in other terms, which is a, you could say, a, a one-time sort of mini fund or an entity that's created for each deal that's done. So for example, oh guys, I've got a deal to invest in Uber, you know, in the early days. We've been given 500K allocation, um, whoever wants to invest and it fills up from your network that you've built and uh, you invest and you invest on on the company's cap table as one entity rather than the hundred angels that have poured money into your entity now it's been facilitated or popularized initially by angel list of course the goats Uh, and then in the uk platforms like our friends that we use odin create syndicates and if uh, you cannot fill the whole whole allocation with your own uh, network contacts you can also lean on odin's community for example to get them to fill the rest of the allocation now Ryan says the cons of doing SPVs or syndicates in other terms. One, 
lots of work every deal is a mini raise true number two that's true (laughs) number two unable to guarantee capital until it's raised again very true number three slow for competitive rounds Mm, if you're hot you will not find it difficult necessarily and that depends on building the right infrastructure and network and contacts where with just a ping of a button you send a message to 50 people and whoever's in is in and you've raised the money within a day or two but building that trusted network can take a little bit of a time but it's worth it long term but anyway his cons mostly i agree with them especially the first two but you can't have your cake and eat it too there is a con with any of these options and you just have to weigh out which of these options uh, the pros outweigh the cons for you in your specific circumstances in your personal life the pros he says deal by deal carry correct leverage is capital true if you you know if you only have 2k to invest but then you can raise 200k as we see people in the odin community they raise large sums and they're just daily operators in a tech company they get good deal flow through their contacts they put in maybe a few grand but they raise another 100 grand 200 grand from friends and odin community so and that you can leverage that capital number three flexible for low and high volume investing true and number four builds trust with investors true now for us we have this we initially had a plan we said okay we're going to do an official because previously we were doing let's say tiny or small syndicates which was uh, us with maybe friends doing small private syndicates then we said because we're not doing a fund and we have all this interest and soft commits let's do a public syndicates i.e for example jason calacanis is uh, the goat who promotes his syndicates i forgot what the domain is the syndicate.com or syndicate.com if you just google calacanis syndicate it'll come up he typically raises half a million a deal from all of his listeners or supporters and contacts that he's built and he just invests in whatever deal comes across his desk that he likes so we said great we need to build some form of infrastructure like this because we all we also similar to calicanis but of course on a smaller scale we also have viewers and listeners and readers of our content Uh, we also have contacts that we just build up through our network and it's just growing so we said we need to build some sort of infrastructure and number two there is no rush but we need to build relationships with the right people the right key partners which we've been developing a few and we're keen to develop some more and this goes back to the whole values or ethics point which in my view most people in the space completely fucking lack and so for us it's very very important we'd rather delay things by months or even a year or two but right have the right long-term partners on board than just deal with shit people and this goes back to our literally the three values values plus at everywhere on our brand authenticity truth seeking and long-termism and of course morals and ethics being a huge foundation of of all the values uh, and everything we do so i was like fuck it let's start speaking to people let's see who's right for us right partner for us and so the strategy we've now come up with we haven't actually launched the public syndicates yet they'll be launching in a few months full details of course you know i like to pitch so you'll hear about it for sure but in the meantime there was one deal that popped up that we had to do uh, before the official public syndicate launch so some of these partners were involved but it really it was like we had to do the deal in like we had a day and a half or two days to do it so we didn't really tap into our network like that because we didn't have enough time they didn't have enough time so but we did that one deal but in a few months you'll hear about the official public syndicate launch and these are basically lo- much larger syndicates than the small private syndicates we were doing before these are tickets of you could say between 250,000 US dollars up to 1 million US dollars. These are ranging from, you could say, pre-seed, but usually seed and series A deals. And this is through the contacts that we build, the guests that come on the podcast. My classic tweet of every guest we've brought on the pod has gone on to raise a monstrous round. And even in this market, downturn is still growing and doing tremendously well. So index our podcast guests and you will be a rich mofo. And we said, we're going to start syndicating every guest that we like. So that's the plan. So to wrap that up, the strategy is going to be, you know, deal flow comes through the pod and through our network that, that we build off, which I think people don't understand how powerful it compounds the more time the more content you do because in the early days we're like ah this is all right but recently like every few every every month or two the the shit just improves a lot and we haven't even been putting out a lot of content so when we double down on that but in a nutshell the strategy is okay founders want people with skin in the game i allow operators so we said okay let's say give an example but this is how it's going to be let's say a typical 500 grand check in a company series a company we're going to do syndicate great 100k of that or 
80K of that will come from trusted operator investor partners, which means 10 people that we know who are elite operators will put in five to 10 grand each or something. They fill up 20% of the allocation. So you're like, okay, where does the other 80% of the money come from? The other 80% of the money will come from trusted partners who are family offices. Why do we do this? Why do we, for example, fill up 400 grand? Again, this is just an example I'm giving. Why do we fill up 400 grand with family office money as LPs in our syndicate and 100 grand from angels? The angels add value in the form of actual experience operating companies. So the founders want us on their cap table as a syndicate. And number two, the family offices allow us to leverage capital. As Ryan says, the pro of running an SPV is leveraging capital. So the more capital you can leverage, the better. So we we create a win-win-win situation where the founder's like, great, one, I'm getting experience on my cap table through the through the operators they have on, on their syndicate. The family offices are very happy because they know it improves the odds of us getting on and also of the deal doing potentially better because of the value we're adding for the company. And we're happy as well. We bring all parties together. So it's literally a win-win-win situation. It's the most positive sum situation that we could think of. But it comes with a huge but. We've built a few partnerships with a few family offices. The operator investors, that's not really an issue. We've always, not always, but obviously over the last couple of years, we've developed some solid relationships. But the family office front, we are very selective with who we work with and we're slowly building that out to partner with a few more. So that then whatever happens is, what happens is whenever every deal comes across that we are keen on doing, we just ping this across to 15 to 20 family offices and maybe you know our, our usual 30 to 40 operator investors and we do the deal and we're going to systematize it set up all the systems and infrastructure to do this and the reason we need to partner with the right family offices is because the uk is a very fucking anal you have to partner with the right people the family offices that maybe have some young people involved who understand the sector and you're not dealing with some old farts from the city who literally for a seed round uh, or a seed deal are like i want to see the data room and do the in, in very detailed we need five weeks for due diligence and do a financial model and we need to sign an nda and we need to it's like paul graham's like cool bro handshake deal done it's it's not how silicon valley works guys so we're having to you know learn that okay most family offices we cannot partner with and we're partnering with the few where they really get it and they trust our judgment and they know how Silicon Valley works and they allow us to also educate them on the Silicon Valley process, which is new to many people in the UK ecosystem. So that's that. That's uh, I, I want you to give me your views and wrap up, but I try to kind of semi-pitch. I try not to make it sound like a pitch, but also just uh, kind of give give the rationale behind everything and what, what we're doing and why we're doing it. And it's going to take a long time and I fucking love it. Brick by brick, you're going to still see us sitting here talking shit 50 years from now and still investing so i think yeah you you did do a little bit of a pitch there and uh, (laughs) um, the yeah so look to wrap up what cyrus said in 18 minutes let me try it into uh point number one is we decided not to do a fund because of all the reasons we mentioned earlier Point number two is, as a result, we decided to do an SPV structure with multiple deals because of the pros that Ryan Hoover outlines, which I'll just pull up again here. The The value that comes from it is, a, the reason we did that is because of the value that comes from a win-win-win situation that Cyrus outlined. So everybody involved in the deal technically wins there is no real losers and therefore we're not we're not pulling any no we're not pulling any rugs out from it under any carpets uh pulling any carpets out from an, under any feet shout out ali carpet so <laughs> <laughs> so the point is that we're pretty comfortable with where we're at, at the minute that doesn't mean that this is how we're going to be doing deals going forward it just means that our, our current plan is to do this spv structure and it's going well for us and we're enjoying it Maybe in the future we do a fund. Who knows? Let's see. But yeah, no hard and fast rules and we're doing what we enjoy. And that's that's part and parcel of, of uh, living your life and doing what you want to do and saying fuck you to bosses. <laughs> Maybe when we're 40, we turn around and say, yeah, great. This All the things I mentioned, the leafs, they, they've all compounded, they've all flywheeled. And we have a proof of concept from doing whatever 30 40 50 syndicates with no no one breathing down our necks and they've returned well some of them then you'll it'll be a fucking piece of cake you'll it'll be raised you'll be able to raise money more on more favorable terms and with better lps that probably won't treat you like an employee it'll be more with trusted partners that you've built long-term relationships with and we tie it back to the classic quotes uh, everything in life uh, compounds including relationships blah 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 Mr. Navarra, we can't. So it's a good way to tie things up.
<laughs> but yeah, look, it's a lot of work. You have to enjoy this shit. I, I have dreams about this stuff. So uh, if you don't enjoy it, then as the Hodge twins say, do whatever the fuck you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not done. We're not done. Uh, rationalvc.com. Don't forget to check everything out. <laughs> Always be closing. Pitch, pitch, pitch. ABC, ABC. But yeah, that's about it. Genuinely, rationalvc.com. Uh, check it out. And the syndicates will be doing a full public launch in a few months. Stay tuned as we finish off building the infrastructure and. Uh, yeah, bear with us. We, as I said, reduced cadence temporarily. It's all planned. We're, we're very busy for good reasons in professional and personal lives, but everything is uh, ticking along. And thanks for staying with us. Yeah, that's it. Peace. <laughs>